Amber and I sing as we tidy up the cabin and I shovel a path to the woodshed. The worst of the ice storm has passed, and we spent three happy days together, cooking, talking, and playing with Beck. All we need is a dog, and we'd have the perfect little family. Of course, I'm getting ahead of myself. We still have big problems waiting for us. And even though I think our relationship is solid, I haven't asked her to be my girlfriend. Shall we take a walk up to the car and see if we can move it? Amber asks when I finish chipping the ice from the walkway. Everything is melting. I wipe the sweat from my brow. Let's take a look. The driveway is still icy, but patches of it have thawed. After slipping back a few steps, I use the shovel to help me get to the top. The car is covered with a layer of ice, with icicles hanging from the mirrors. I chip off the ice near the door handle, but am unable to get the door open. When I clear the snow around the wheels, I discover all four wheels are locked in a huge block of ice. I don't think we're going to get anywhere until it melts some more, I yell back at Amber. Mist steams from her nose and mouth as she makes her way to the top of the drive. At least we can take a walk and enjoy the thaw. I'm tired of being cooped up inside, and so is Beck. That's a good idea, I say, looking into the valley below. Doubt anyone can get up the road either. Nope, and we're doing okay with the food, although we should pay back your uncle. Of course, I agree. I'll write him a check as soon as I get home. Together we trudge back to the cabin to get Beck ready for our little outing. I know of a little trail not too steep, that takes us to an overlook where we can see the lake. I'm feeling pretty good, and when we set off, I can see the damage the storm caused. Broken branches and limbs are scattered across our path, and some trees have fallen. Both Amber and I wear dark glasses against the blinding glare of the ice, and we still have to be careful when walking below ice-laden trees. A crack followed by a crinkly crash stops us in our tracks. Another tree gives way to its load of ice and falls. Okay, so maybe hiking isn't such a good idea, but I'm eager to see if there's any traffic moving below. Maybe you and Beck should go back to the cabin, I suggest to Amber. Let me get up there and take a few pictures. I can be careful, Amber says. Just have to look up and not walk under any trees that haven't already dropped their load. Okay, then stick close to me. I pick up a relatively straight stick and hand it to her. Use this for balance. She insists on holding Beck in a sling, so she's only able to use one hand for balance. It's beautiful out here, but still a little cold, Amber observes. Nippy. When I last checked, the temperature gauge hovered above the freezing point. I'm hoping it won't take another drop overnight, freezing back everything that thawed. Ice and packed snow crunch underneath our shoes, and I'm wearing my ice-gripping boots with the cleats so it's easier going for me. A splintered icy tree blocks the fork of the trail. Amber tries to cross over it and slips. I lunge and grab her arm at the same time she catches herself with a walking stick. I can do it, she insists, even though it's better for me to cross first and lift her over. Just accept my hand. I'm here to help you. I flash her a smile and lift her and Beck over the trunk. Now, wasn't that easier? You have those special shoes. She says, but I notice she's using the walking stick more, thumping it down like a third leg. The overlook isn't too much farther, I assure her. It's a beautiful day, the calm after the storm. It is. She agrees. Magical. Sunlight sparkles over the ice crystals, making them look like millions of glittering diamonds. And the sky above is clear blue, the kind that lets you see for miles. The air is crisp, with just a tinge of bite to it. But the tiny breeze is gentle, tickling our cheeks with cold fingers. We ascend to the overlook, and there, down below, spreads the giant Lake Coeur d'Alene. It's encased in ice close to shore, but the water is darker farther out where it's deeper. It's like a picture postcard, Amber says. Or one of those Christmas cards with glitter all over. Better. I marvel at the wondrous and breathtaking view below. Every tree sparkles in the sun like a unique ornament and the vastness of the lake is humbling. Let's take some pictures, she says. No one will believe I was up here in the middle of the ice storm. It's turned everything into giant ice sculptures. Even the waves down there are frozen. We take selfies, including Beck, who is so bundled up we can barely see his pink little face. How about one more? 
I stretch out my arm, ready for the kill shot. Right as I tap the shutter button, I bend over and kiss Amber. And then her arms are around me, and I almost drop the phone. That's all we've been doing in between eating, talking, and playing with Beck. Kissing and touching, although fully clothed. I respect her too much to indulge, and I know she's not there yet. I wouldn't want to add to her guilt. What she needs is to get back in good graces with her family, and I'm not the man to stand in her way.